Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story, client was hoping we would knock over her TV. We didn't meet her expectations and so she knocked it over herself and demanded a new TV. The second story, buyer refused to buy my bike for a fixed price so he won't get additional important details. The third story, union tale of smug amusement and pitting a bad manager against others that weren't. And the first story is, when playing Jenga with electronics is not recommended. In my youth, approximately 20 years ago, I was the delivery driver for a furniture company. We delivered all sorts of things, appliances, electronics, and furniture. There is a misconception that if a delivery driver breaks something on accident, not what they're delivering, something that's already in the house, that the company they work for will replace it with something new. Therefore, people will tend to call and make up false reports or attempt to sabotage said drivers so that they catch the blame for something that is entirely not their doing. So let's step into the Wayback Machine and look in on someone trying to get something for nothing. My partner and I arrived at the location for a bedroom delivery. We knocked on the customer's door and made introductions. The cast is I, OP, CL for crazy lady, and WB for work buddy. After making introductions, we asked her to show us which bedroom the furniture was going in and asked her if she had any preference as to the layout. At first, everything seemed to be going smooth. She wasn't worried about how we set up the furniture as long as everything fit, which was good because in general with apartment complexes there's only one really good way to put the furniture in, and WB and I had been delivering long enough that we could generally pick the best spot for each piece of furniture at a glance. We told her that we were going to be unboxing her furniture in the truck and that we would be bringing it in shortly. The first thing to note about this apartment is that there was not any other furniture. This isn't usual, a lot of people start off slowly. But in the living room she did have one folding chair and three standard milk crates stacked vertically with a 19 inch box TV sitting on top of them. For those of you who don't know why this is a horrible idea, 20 years ago 19 inch televisions were bulky and although not particularly heavy, would be extremely top heavy sitting on the top of three hollow milk crates. More about this in a minute. WB and I started carrying the furniture from the truck into the apartment. Every time we walked by it we gave the leaning tower of TV a wide berth. We didn't have a deep conversation about it, but before we started bringing the furniture in we did speak about it briefly to make sure the other one was aware. As we came in with the last piece, the dresser, we mentioned to CL that this was the last piece and that we were going to start assembling her furniture. We made it down the hall and into the bedroom. As we were setting down the dresser we heard a crash in the living room. Immediately following we heard a string of cussing. We went back into the living room to make sure everything was okay. And I'll give you three guesses but you'll only need one. The television was on the floor, laying on its side and actually sparking. I quickly stepped up and unplugged the TV and its life force fizzled out. She began to rant and rave about how we broke her television and the store owed her a new one. We tried to explain to CL that we were in the bedroom when the television fell, that we weren't responsible. And when all of that failed we told her that she should probably contact the store, that we cannot promise her anything. WB called the boss and explained the situation to him before she could, so when she called him he would have our side of the story first. WB and I went and put the bedroom set together as quickly as possible. We got CL to sign for the delivery while she was still talking to our boss, and we got out while getting was good. We got back to the store and met our boss in his office. Somehow CL managed to convince him that despite the fact that we were in a different room, and that she had the TV basically in a Joker style hero trap, that it was our fault. And basically the boss said that it was our responsibility to replace the television. That we had to get her something equal to or better than what she had. Neither WB or I was happy with this, but essentially we were over a barrel. I went home that night angry because I was getting ready to upgrade my own television, and now I was gonna have to spend the money on replacing this CL's TV. I went home, had a decent meal, went to my room and started to turn on my television, when I had an epiphany. My hand had stopped just so I have the power button, because I realized that I was staring at her television. Now I don't mean that it was just a television I was going to give her, I mean it was the exact same RCA model and size as the TV that fell off the tower. It was quite literally the exact same television people. And this is where the malicious compliance came in. The next morning I brought my television with me to work. I put it in the back of the work truck and asked my boss if I could take WB to go pick out a TV and deliver it to her. I got the green light for that. We went to a pawn shop that I knew well and find myself a nice 36 inch flat screen TV. Not completely flat like LCD, just an upgrade from the tube. Remember folks, we were still working with flip phones back then. WB thought I was buying it for her and tried to argue that it was way too nice and that we were spending way too much money. I told him just to give me 20 bucks and not to worry about the price. He saw why when we opened up the back of the work truck and his grin was as big as mine. 
I did deliver that nice bigger TV to my house where I placed it where the other television had been. I spent the time driving explaining to him that I had already had the television to replace hers at home, and we both knew that she was going to be furious. But my boss did say equal to or better, and you can't get more equal to than the exact same television. We delivered the television. When she answered the door, I set my TV next to hers on the ground. WB already had his flip phone open with the camera engaged. I plug it in, showed her how it worked, and WB snapped a picture of it. CL immediately started going on a tirade about how she was supposed to get a new television. She told me that my boss had promised her a flat TV. Then I explained to her the fact that I was only responsible for giving her the equivalent of what she lost. When she realized she wasn't winning the argument and we were on our way out, she actually had the nerve to ask us to put it back up on the milk crates for her. We told her that if she wanted it up there, she can get it up there herself. Our responsibility to her was over. WB and I loaded up into our box truck and rode into the sunset, never to darken her doorstep again. P.S. She did call the store and complain a day or so later, but I did explain to my boss exactly what happened. Apparently the idea to make us replace the TV was his boss's call, and he didn't exactly agree with it either. But with the picture and the receipt which just said RCA TV, not the size or anything. That's why I love pawn shops. He also explained to her that we were only responsible for equal value. And in the end, I was only out the amount of money I could have gotten for that TV on trade, which I found out later wasn't much. Edit. Just realized I wasn't very clear on one point. She had the leaning tower really close to the front door. I believe she was hoping that we would knock it over. And when we failed to live up to her expectation, she knocked it over herself while we were in the other room. The second story is... Don't want to pay my asking price? Okay. Years ago, I sold my first motorcycle. It was a good bike, but as it was my first motorcycle, I had laid it down a couple times doing stupid stuff, so it wasn't perfect. I took good care of it though and always replaced damaged and scratched things because I didn't want it to look bad. Well, except for the left side of the engine, aka the stator cover. The sides of most motorcycle engines will often make contact with the ground and get scratched up if the bike slides on its side, which mine did on several occasions. I had replaced the stator cover before and didn't want to go through that again, even though it's only about a $120 part. Plus, the scrapes on the stator cover weren't that bad and I could live with them. So I list my bike for sale, show it to a few people, and along comes a dad with his young adult son. Now, the dad being an older and wiser rider, riding for as many years as the moon has orbited planet Earth, knew he had the better end of the bargain. He was there looking at my first bike that had been gently crashed before, which I was fully upfront about. Easy bargain, right? I was pretty firm on my asking price, for one simple reason. I was going to throw in all the brand new parts, accessories, and maintenance items I had accumulated for this bike. A couple of oil filters, case of oil, brake pads, a new stator cover, and even an inoperable engine, which still had many, many good parts on it. But if and only if they had paid my asking price. This was easily over $300 in parts, excluding the engine. The dad of the buyer played the bad cop in the scenario, pointing out things that he thought could give him some bargaining power and then of course made a lower offer. I entertained the offer, but at the same time informed them of my conditions for getting the spare parts. We don't need the spare parts. Okay, I counter-offered, explaining that my asking price was already very competitive given the condition of my bike. We settled on $100 less than my asking price, so they left with only the bike and none of the parts. A few days go by and the buyer reaches back out to me to ask me if they can come by to pick up the stator cover for free to replace the scratched one that was on the bike. I replied with, Sorry, I'm going to sell it to make up for the discount I gave you on the motorcycle. A replacement stator cover cost more than the $100 they saved on the purchase. But if they paid me that $100, they would have gotten the cover, along with supplies for their first oil change. 80 bucks, brake pads, 75 bucks, sprockets, 90 bucks, plus a whole nother engine to tinker around with. The engine had catastrophically failed, so it wasn't worth much, but the parts on it are still expensive to buy new. The third story is... I'm sorry, I've been instructed not to help you with that. I work in a public sector that's a union shop with a pretty active union. The opportunity to comply with poorly worded directions comes along fairly often if you're a shop steward. And while sometimes it's worth a grievance, sometimes it's just way more fun to do precisely as I'm told. And they never seem to get that's what comes next after I utter my favorite phrase in the world. Hey, would you mind sending me an email summarizing this so I have to refer it back to? We've used up until really recently, a mainframe emulation program that's the flower of 1970s technology for the bulk of the work we do. I'm a bit of a geek for this stuff, and one thing I figured out how to do a number of years ago was write macros to automate actions. Everything from notices to be mailed out, to flipping through data screens looking for information, and even some data entry, could all be automated. 
I was smart enough to not brag about this too much, so I didn't get voluntold to help support people with it. But I did tinker with it for a years, and had a pre-built tool set that I shared with anyone who asked. A friend I helped that way moved into management, and she contacted me asking for help with her staff, because she knew how useful it was but not his to do it herself. On a separate note and also because I'm kind of a geek, I was representing a worker at that time who had been in a particular manager's crosshairs, to the point that they'd had IT put a completely unsubtle keylogger on her computer. I was helping her with something else, and was looking over her shoulder at her screen, when I saw one of the alerts it tossed up. I asked her about it and she said it was weird, but she didn't know what it was, so I dug through her computer a bit, and I showed her what was going on. The reaction from this manager was volcanic. She summoned me to her desk, and admonished me about doing stuff that wasn't my job, and gave me very specific instructions that I was not under any circumstances to assist people with their computers, or anything else that wasn't spelled out in my position description. Sounds good. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. Could I get you to shoot me that in an email so I can follow up with any clarification? Certainly, she beamed at me. This was going so well. About two weeks later, my manager friend, who had had to pull some strings to get me released for a day to come out to her branch, in another county it was about 45 miles away, came by, since I was going to ride out with her. I showed her the letter from Miss Thou Shalt Not, who incidentally wasn't my supervisor, and I knew full well hadn't told my boss about it or their boss. Sorry, I was instructed not to help with this. Not much I can do, see? She read through it and looked back at me with a small but evil smile. You saved this just for me, didn't you? Of course I did. Merry Christmas in August, I guess. She had had no end of trouble with Miss Thou Shalt Not in the past, and the opportunity to rain some hellfire was just too good. She took the copy of the email with her, and they had a private meeting in one of the conference rooms, and were joined about five minutes in by their mutual supervisor, who I was also on good terms with. She never did tell me what was said behind closed doors, but before the end of the day, I had an email retracting the previous instructions, and the manager responsible never referenced it again. The best part is, too, the employee I'd been helping told me a day or two later that she'd stop getting those weird alerts all of a sudden, and asked if I knew anything about that. The last story is... Just sign this document that will dock you 11.5 hours. I'm a middle school teacher who speaks fluent Spanish, thanks to growing up in the West Valley. Go Suns! The fact that I'm bilingual has given me many opportunities, including one where a teacher in charge of an English language learner, ELL, important acronym for later, program, gave me the opportunity to tutor students twice weekly, plus an additional 15 minutes per every hour worked as prep time. Okay, cool. So Mondays and Fridays, I punch in 15 minutes before 2.20, during my 7th hour prep, then punch out at 3.30 when the kids left. No problem, right? Wrong. At the end of the year, I get an email saying I'm being docked 11.5 hours that were punched in before the end of the day. I was livid. They claimed I'm getting double paid, but I looked through everything I signed off on and didn't remember seeing any restrictions on when I was to punch in for those hours. We met in the office and the district representative had me sign this document, and she showed me the contract I signed. Nowhere did it specify when I was to punch in those hours, and I brought this to both people's attention who was present, but Federal Action Plan, FAP, Office Lady persisted, just sign it, you can't get double paid. Enter Malicious Compliance. I signed quickly, this time using my middle name, which happens to be F this BS. It read O F this BSP. I happen to know the person at district office, D.O. Savior, who will be reviewing this paperwork, and know that she'll either ask me what's up, or to have me re-sign an obvious non-signature. Like clockwork, I got a phone call on my 7th hour prep from D.O. Savior. She asked why I sign like this and why I'm being docked. I explained my working with the two new students who don't speak any English all year, and even teaching them both English all year. I explained that no one said anything all year, and that I'd have made the adjustment to get paid those hours the entire school year. She, DOS, says, Wait a minute, you were on your prep time, right? And you're bilingual? Do you have a cert? All answers were yes. My next paycheck was $3,500 more than my standard paycheck, coming out of the FAP lady's budget for federal action plans. I was very confused at first. It appears that I can punch in during my contract hours if it's on my scheduled prep. And because I have an ELL endorsement, I got this endorsement working with monolingual students in the West Valley and my direct supervisor on campus doesn't, I get paid as an ELL leader on campus, quite the stipend. So what was supposed to be a $345 deduction in pay for me turned out to be 10 times greater, as a deduction from their department paid directly to me. So looks like FAP ladies right. I can't get double paid.
but looks like I can get double quintuple paid. Subscribe, click the like button if you want to support the channel. Thank you for watching.